And so uh, I just trust that you will be blessed this evening by uh, this student of the word, our own Neil Bowling. And so, Neil, I invite you to come up and share with us this evening. Six days into the new year, I don't think it's we're too far along to say Lashana Tava. Uh, this week we're coming to the Torah portion, the one falling between Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, which we celebrated this past week, Sunday and Monday, and Yom Kippur, the Feast of Atonement, which is coming up this next week, as we mentioned in the announcements, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, Tuesday with our uh, Kol Nidre service, where we're dressed in white traditionally and begin our fast, and then uh, the following day when we break that fast together. But as we approach this very important appointed time of Yom Kippur, let us prepare our hearts to return to God in every aspect of our lives, and most importantly, to reflect upon the atonement that we have in Messiah Yeshua. Let us pray. Vinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, Lord, we thank you once again for this divine, this divine appointed time, Lord, the Shabbat, where we come together to acknowledge you and to fellowship, Lord, and to be renewed for the upcoming week. We thank you for sustaining us and allowing us to reach this season of these final two appointed times of Yom Kippur, Lord, and then uh, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And as we rejoice, Lord, that we have been written into the book of life, Lord, by the favor and grace and the atonement provided by Messiah Yeshua, we pray that we would not let that be a reason not to look into our hearts as to how we can be better followers of you. We pray that we would uh, take full advantage of this time you've given to us, these days of awe, as we uh, search and seek deep within ourselves, Lord, of how uh, we may better honor you with our lives uh, and where we can turn around and return closer to you. We just praise you and worship you. We ask this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. So this week's Torah portion is the shortest of all the portions, so we'll try to get through it in the next hour and a half or so. so. <laughs> and we'll try to make it about 30 minutes, but uh, in this Torah portion, we hear the last two commandments of all the commandments. God will conclude the instructions that he has for his people. It begins with the announcement, however, that at the good old age of 120 years old, Moshe will no longer accompany the Israelites on their journey to the promised land that they're getting ready to inherit. We read, Then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel. He said to them, I am 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in. Adonai has said to me, You are not to cross over this Jordan. The expression Hayom, used here and translated as today in this verse, often implies this very day in Scripture and would suggest that this could be the very day on which Moshe was born, his birthday. However, on this day, the people would not be celebrating because their leader who has been with them since the time that the Lord brought them out of Egypt has just announced that he will no longer be with them. Can you imagine how the Israelites may have felt hearing this news? Given that on numerous occasions already, they've expressed in discouragement the desire to turn around and go back to Egypt. Now they would be facing an unprecedented situation, a future journey without Moshe. Understanding the possibility of this dejection, Moshe comforts them by assuring them that God will continue to be with them in his absence and that he would never leave them or abandon them. We read, Adonai your God, he will cross over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you and you will dispossess them. Joshua will cross over before you, just as Adonai has promised. Adonai will do to them, just as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. Adonai will give them over to you, and you are to do to them according to all the mitzvot that I commanded you. Chazak, be courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble before them. For Adonai, your God, he is the one who goes before you. He will not fail you. Or abandon you. Moses reminds the Israelites that God will never leave them or forsake them, something we need to be reminded of ourselves repeatedly because like the Israelites, 
We all exhibit the natural inclination to put faith in the things that can be seen rather than the things that cannot be seen, namely God. Oftentimes we go through trials, especially after circumstances have been favorable. Though we believe deep down that Adonai has been intervening in the circumstances of our lives, in our flesh, we can begin to doubt that it was really him and instead convince ourselves that some of our resources, maybe the people in our lives or some other tangible thing that was once with us and we no longer have was really what made all the difference. But this is a lie that the enemy would use to destroy our faith and lead us into the sin of idolatry. Until this point, the Israelites have experienced God intimately, witnessing his signs and his wonders and experiencing firsthand the deliverance from the destruction of their enemies. But now, whether they believe it was him or not, will be tested as it has been tested before. Do we remember what happened the first time the Israelites thought that Moses was not coming back? We read in Shemot, Exodus chapter 32. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, Get up and make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, there's the lie, we do not know what's become of him. So Aaron said to them, Break off the golden rings that are in your ears, your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden rings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He received them from their hand and made a golden calf, fashioned with chiseling tool. Then they said, This is your God, Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. We don't say that loud because we don't want to remind the Lord. Will Israel pass the test this time, though? You'll have to tune in next week to find out. <laughs> no, but we too, we must be careful that we ever acknowledge that it is not the things of the world that are enabling us to live, long suffer through tough times and thrive in times of prosperity, but rather that it is God himself that is orchestrating the circumstances of our lives for our good, sustaining us, and even in tough times, using them to cause us to make teshuva and return to him. So often we can find ourselves on the slippery slope of attributing our well-being to something other than God. Mm -hmm. When we proclaim statements like, well, if this didn't happen, then that wouldn't have happened. Or if I didn't have this, fill in the blank, I wouldn't have that. And many other similar fleeting affirmations. Or perhaps some of us are guilty of suggesting that a positive outcome in our lives is a result of luck or chance. The truth is that we neither know what the end result might have been if things happen different in any of our past circumstances, nor is anything governed by mere chance or what the world refers to as luck in their attempt to deny the existence of a creator who will accomplish things according to his will. Amen. As is conveyed here in this parsha, as well as throughout the scriptures, God would have us to trust in him for everything. We do not need to have an answer for everything, nor can we. He tells us that his ways are higher than our ways. When trying to understand how God will accomplish the plan he has revealed to us regarding the salvation of all Israel, Rob Shaul, Paul the Apostles, compelled to say in Romans 11, verse 33, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how incomprehensible his ways. His ways are incomprehensible. We just need to trust that he will accomplish all that he has promised to. And in all of this, our creator does not demand perfect faith, only that our faith is ever increasing in him as we navigate through the difficulties of this life. That is why we're told that the testing of our faith produces growth. In Yaakov, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, he says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect work, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Amen. In this portion, God knows that Israel's faith is not perfect, and he provides them with a physical man in Moshe's place, Yehoshua, Joshua, to take them into the promised land. We read, Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong, be courageous, 
For you are to go with this people into the land that Adonai has sworn to your fathers to give them, and you are to enable them to inherit it. Adonai, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or abandon you. Do not fear or be discouraged. Amen. The promise that was first given corporately to Israel is now being given personally to Joshua by Moses himself in the sight of everyone in order to convey to Israel that the leadership of Joshua would be no different than that which was provided by Moses. Additionally, the promise of God's continued presence and provision is affirmed once more. The Torah portion continues with the commandment known as Hakel, in which the Torah was to be read every Shemitah, every seven years during the Feast of Sukkot, so that the teaching of it would perpetuate throughout all generations. In verses 10 and 11, we read, Then Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the set time of the year of canceling debts during the Feast of Sukkot, when all Israel comes to appear before Adonai your God in the place he chooses, you are to read this Torah before them in our hearing. And Jeff read that for us earlier. And when we look at these verses, in a way, this commandment here, which is one of the last two of all God's commandments, also serves as a comfort to the people in coping with the loss of Moses. While they have already been assured that God will continue to fight on their behalf and that Joshua will serve them as a leader, they're now given a commandment that if kept, will ensure that they never forget God's instructions. And this is important because they have been told before that knowing and obeying the Torah itself is the key to inheriting and prolonging their possession in the land. In Deuteronomy ch chapter 8 we read, You are to take care to do the whole mitzvah that I am commanding you today, so that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that Adonai swore to your fathers. You're to remember all the way that Adonai, your God, has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his mitzvot or not. He afflicted you. He let you hunger. Then he fed you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, in order to make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Adonai. Amen. Additionally, from we learn from these verses that life itself depends on the very words of God. And it is necessary to understand that these words are not attached to Moses, but rather to God. That is why later in this parsha, the writing of the Torah is concluded and placed in the ark so that Israel would know that they have the words of God even when Moses is gone. In fact, it would be through the people of Israel, the Jewish people, that God would faithfully preserve these words for the world to know. But it is still from God alone that we have received them. And it's interesting that Yeshua, our Messiah, had to remind the people many years later of this very fact when he said in Yochanan, John chapter 6, verse 32, Yeshua answered them, Amen, amen, I tell you, it isn't Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The portion continues with the commissioning of Joshua by God himself as Moses is told once more that he is nearing death and he is commanded to bring Joshua into the tent of meeting where God would meet with them in a pillar of cloud. In the first words of Joshua's commissioning, God says, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers, speaking to Moses, then this people will rise up and prostitute themselves with the foreign gods of the land they are entering. They will abandon me and break my covenant that I cut with them. To paraphrase, God tells Moses, as soon as you're gone and Joshua's in control, everything's going to fall to pieces. It's well how it sounds. And actually, we find out that this would not happen until after Joshua would die in Judges chapter 2, verse 7. But God continues by describing what he will allow to happen to the Israelites when they turn away, saying, then my anger will flare against them on that day, and I will abandon them and hide my face from them, so they will be devoured, and many evils and troubles will come on them. They will say on that day, Is it not because our God is not among us that these evils have come on us? Despite the repetitive promises from God himself that he would never leave them, and even here that when they turn away from him, he merely hides his face from them, 
Rather than acknowledging that it is them that have left the one true God for other gods, they point the finger and blame him for the calamities that have befallen them. But before we criticize the conclusion that the Israelites reach in the trying times that they would face, we must recognize that we too are capable of reaching the same conclusion if we turn aside from following the Lord. As we examine this passage, we see clearly that God has not departed from his people, but their decision to turn to other gods would make his presence imperceivable to them. We can all experience a similar, a similar phenomenon in different measures in times when we don't follow the Lord fully. Turning away from God's commandments and prioritizing our own pursuits in this world can easily produce an insensitivity to his presence in our lives, thus making it harder to believe that he is even with us. I myself experienced this to some extent simply when I don't sanctify a portion of my day to spend time with him, and that's just the result of one day. But this is why we are told to renew our minds daily in Romans 12, verse 2. And the longer one distances themselves from God, the harder it can be to perceive him. And the conclusion that he has left, though false, can easily be reached. And I believe that this is perhaps why this warning and prophecy, which God refers to as a song of witness, is being given to Israel. He says in verse 19, Now write this song for yourselves and teach it to B'nai Israel. Put it in their mouth so that this song may be a witness for me against B'nai Israel. It's almost unbelievable that the Israelites would write, study, and speak this song and yet fulfill the things contained within it by turning to other gods in times of great prosperity. But how this can possibly be, this mystery, is not something that is unique to them, but rather indicative about the human condition. When we consider the mistakes of the Israelites, which God chose to preserve for us in his word, we can better understand who we are and what we are prone to. Rob Shaul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, Now these things happen to them as an example, and it is written down as a warning to us on whom the ends of the ages have come. When we look at God's people, the Israelites, and the accounts that he has preserved for us, we see a microcosm of the human condition, the natural desire to choose ourselves over him. We are only able to combat this with the help of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and a genuine love for God demonstrated by obedience to his commandments. We learn this from the master himself in John chapter 14, when he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the father and he will give you another helper so that he may be with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Amen. And Paul tells us in Galatians 5, 16, but I say walk by the Ruach and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. In his faithfulness, he not only makes a way for us to be seen as righteous in his sight, by providing his son as an atonement for us, but he makes it possible for us to continue to follow him by promising to remain with us as we work out our salvation. But if we take another look at the prophecy of the song referenced in this passage, which will be recited and talked about in detail next week in Parsha Hazinu, we're able to see another way in which God is faithful to us, even when we stray away from him as the Israelites did for a time. Commenting on verse 17 from a different perspective, uh, one of the rabbis, uh, Rabbi Sforno says, Israel despairs feeling that it has failed God so grievously that even prayer and repentance are useless. But God says no, he will never let Israel fall. He will always protect his people, but his presence will be concealed. He comments that there will be times when Jews feel like God disappeared, but he is always present, only concealed. But another famous rabbi commented in like matter in his letter to the Romans when he said, What then shall we say in view of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Amen. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. 
Who is the one who condemns? It is Messiah who died and moreover was raised and is now at the right hand of God and who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Messiah? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. Amen. The tribulations that would befall Israel and the times of judgment during which God concealed his presence from them did not invalidate his faithfulness and love for his chosen people. The same can be said about those of us who have been grafted in to Israel. As we have just read, the evidence of this is the fact that rather than sparing his son, God gave him up for us all. This should, be, this should give us confidence that no matter how imperceivable God may be to us at a given time, no matter how far we have strayed, no action renders it impossible for us to make Teshuvah and turn back to him like a prodigal son returning to his father. Amen. The Torah portion concludes with the completion of the Torah scroll by Moses and the careful storing of it in the ark, ensuring that nothing could be added to or taken away from the written word of God and rendering it impossible to falsify what it says. Verse 24 emphasizes that the Torah was written onto a book until its conclusion. Commenting on this verse, the rabbis state the following, God commanded Moses and Joshua to write the Torah and to teach it to the people and to place the scroll at the side of the ark. Times would come when the masses would forsake the Torah and be drawn after the cultures of the surrounding society. But that written Torah would remain as a constant reminder of Israel's roots and the unchanging focus of its devotion. Here they acknowledge that as the Torah testifies, even though Adonai had given the Jewish people his very ways, his commandments, his instructions for righteous living that was unique from the practices of the other nations, they would adopt the practices of the nations in fulfillment of the prophecies of this psalm. But they also acknowledged the faithfulness of God to ensure that the Torah would be ever preserved and that he would draw them back to their Jewish roots. And I would venture to say that God is using the Messianic movement to fulfill this prophetic purpose of revealing the Messiah to his people and restoring them to their Jewish roots. As we witness the Jewish people in this day and age accepting Messiah Yeshua, we often find that their Jewish faith plays a more meaningful role in their lives and they feel more compelled to embrace it. And despite the fact that they have been so often told that accepting the Jewish Messiah means they must abandon their faith and culture, we in the Messianic movement affirm the opposite, that Messiah did not come to start a new faith, but to complete an old one, Amen. and that there is nothing more Jewish than accepting the Jewish Messiah Amen. and living out the instructions that he has given us. Thank you, but within all this, we see the same phenomenon as it appears. Isaac and Jacob. This lie too is being deconstructed as we see through this movement, the messianic movement, the eyes of the Gentiles being opened as they recognize the Jewish roots of the faith that has become their own through the grafting into the olive tree of Israel. In my opinion, this aspect is as important as the first because we are reminded as Gentiles in Romans 11 verse 11, I say to them, they did not stumble as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their false step, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. Thank you, Lord. We see here that the momentary turning away of the Jewish people would result in the God of Israel extending his grace to the Gentiles, that we might play a role in leading his people back to him. Yes. In fact, in a way, the Messianic movement's primary objective is as much, if not more, the role of the Gentiles. But this objective is not accomplished when we create a thousand different ways to live out the Jewish faith. 
and thus rebuild the wall of partition that Messiah tore down. If we have the same roots, we are the same tree. It is impossible to be the same tree, however, and grow different fruit from one another. Let us be encouraged in the days ahead to be unified in our following Messiah Yeshua as Jew and Gentile coming together as one, returning to the Jewish roots of our faith that were written down in their entirety in the events of this portion. As we approach the Day of Atonement, let us reflect on the truths that are found in the last few portions as we contemplate the atoning work of the Lord and how we can be better followers of Messiah Yeshua in the year to come. Shabbat Shalom and Lashana Tova. Thank you, Neil. Some words of uh, encouragement and some words of some food for thought. Uh, as um, it's interesting how it seems like it was such a, a long time ago and the situation was so different, and yet we seem to uh, have many of the same struggles uh, that the Israelites went through, even in our modern world. And. Uh, I appreciate Neil uh, bringing a message that encourages us to, to learn uh, from their mistakes so that we might not repeat them. 